Well, this morning as we prepare to remember our Lord's sacrifice for us, I'd like to start off with a passage in Ephesians that to me is one of the most tender uh, representations of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for his bride that we have in all of Scripture. It's a very familiar passage. It's one that we use all the time when we challenge husbands to love their wives. And we find it in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And then down to verse 29, it talks about Christ nourishing and cherishing the church because we are members of his body. And then Paul says, this mystery is profound. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. I think so often we in the church underestimate how much Jesus loves the church. We see in this passage that he loved her so much that he gave himself up for her. And we know that this is a direct reference to his crucifixion on the cross. He shed his blood. He gave his life in order to save his bride. He uses the word of God to cleanse her, to wash her, because his goal is that one day she will be able to be presented to him as the groom in splendor without any spot or wrinkle or any blemish whatsoever. He nourishes the church. He cherishes the church. He cleanses the church. He washes the church. He uses his word to correct her, to chasten her, to direct her, all so that one day we will, as his bride, be able to stand before him completely and perfectly holy and without blemish. This is how special, how precious the bride is to Jesus. And so, kind of laying that groundwork as introduction to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where I'll invite you to turn now, we now come to the celebration of that very act by which the husband gave himself up for his bride. And in this 11th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is speaking to uh, immature believers, Christians that have largely misunderstood what it's all about, uh, Christians that have been saved from all walks of life, all form of religions, all uh, different levels of uh, economic wealth and uh, prestige. Uh, we're talking about the wealthiest of the wealthy who lived uh, in Corinth, uh, all the way down to the day laborers, the slaves, who literally were the property of others. And so uh, it's easy to understand how they, you know, made mistakes, how they misunderstood or misjudged the value of what they were doing. It's easy for us to understand how they uh, fell into the trap of just going through the motions instead of really understanding the heart of the matter. And so as, as Paul launches into this chapter, he is going to have harsh words for them. I'm so thankful that there was a church at Corinth. I'm so thankful that there were believers who just misunderstood so many things, um, just missed the mark in so many ways. I'm grateful to them because the book of 1 Corinthians has become to us today just a treasure chest of not only learning how to correct our behavior, but so much more than that, and especially in teaching us how to better understand the heart of God. Uh, in the very beginning of, uh, of chapter 11, uh, Paul commends uh, the Corinthian believers for the way they handled that whole head covering question, and we are not going to go there this morning. Uh, but he just said, you know, you guys are doing a great job at remembering what I instructed you to do. And, uh, and so I commend you in it. But then when we get down to verse 17, and we begin the discussion now on the Lord's Supper, he says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but it's for the worse. And just a little bit of background information. It was very common in uh, first century Christianity that every time 
believers got together just as what we would call today a potluck, just the opportunity to eat together, to fellowship together, to visit together, to love on each other, to share food and to enjoy each other's company. Uh, many times, if not every time, there was this kind of gathering. Uh, the church would finish uh, their love feast together, their potluck together, with the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and they would take advantage of that opportunity to remember what the Lord had done. And so Paul now needs to address what the love feasts had turned into. And he said, first of all, it's, it's, it's not for the better that you're getting together. In fact, it's, it's worse. And maybe another way of saying that is that God would be happier, believers, if you didn't get together and have a love feast and then celebrate the Lord's Supper if you're going to continue to do it the way you're doing it. And so for more understanding of that, he, he continues in verse 18 with this, for in the first place, when you come together as a church, and we're going to assume in someone's home, probably a wealthier person's home that was larger and had room for everyone to gather, he said, I hear that there are divisions among you. And he said, and I believe it in part, uh, because we know in the very beginning of 1 Corinthians, he dealt with that whole subject of, of divisions and, and how everybody was kind of choosing their favorite person. You know, their favorite apostle, their favorite disciple, their favorite Bible teacher. And they were allowing their personal preference to really just kind of more or less divide everybody up into competing groups. And, uh, and as we understand today, just human nature would take us to the place where, um, you know, my group's better than your group because my teacher's better than your teacher. And all the reasons why, and all the reasons why you're inferior. And so, you know, the, the very gift of God to the church in a multitude of teachers and scholars and, 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 and folks that really helped others understand the Word of God, and instead of seeing it as a blessing and, and as a, a gift from God, it turned into this competitive, divisive mechanism. And so Paul says, I'm hearing, I'm kind of hearing through the grapevine that you are all divided up. And he said, I, I believe it because I've seen it before. But then in verse 19, he makes this incredible statement. For there must be factions among you. There must be divisions among you. And the word there must be is really just another way of saying it is necessary. Or it is a necessity that there are these division opportunities available in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. You know, I'm going to rephrase it. I'm going to maybe put it in some different words because today... In our current situation, it's probably not so often that we are lining up under our favorite Bible teacher or pastor or scholar um, or program or ministry that divides us. Uh, I see so often what divides us is um, disagreements that we have about maybe understanding God's Word or applying God's Word. Um, ways that we, that we disrespect each other, ways that we speak ill of each other ways that we take advantage of each other. And, uh, and so a lot of it, from my understanding, really kind of comes down to more relational problems than it does so much uh, maybe theological problems. If we were to couch this verse like this, for there must be folks in your church that drive you crazy in order that those who are genuine among you might be recognized, maybe that would mean more to us. Maybe it would help us to understand that one of the reasons why there is so much diversity in the family of God, in the church of Christ, or the bride of Christ, is because the Lord uses those differences not just to bother us, not just to bug us, not just to make our life difficult or inconvenient or sometimes maybe even miserable. He uses those divisions in order to give us the opportunity to demonstrate that we are approved, which literally just means that we pass the test as genuine believers because of our response to those difficult people. And I need to remind us all that those difficult people aren't necessarily trying to be difficult. It's just who they are, or it's just how they are, or it's just what they've been through, or it's just how they were raised, or it's just that God is choosing 
to use them to kind of stir the pot in such a way as to cause us discomfort. You know, I, I'll confess to you that as I look back over years of church life, and I've watched myself and others kind of deal with this very thing, it's, it's almost comical that we spend most of our time and effort just trying to figure out a way to get rid of the problem. Um, we'll ignore those people. We'll stay away from those people. We won't sit anywhere close to those people in the church. Um, we'll do everything we can to be sure that a conversation doesn't get started. Um, and in the worst case scenario, there are just times when people just say, I think it's time for us to find another church. All because of the uh, discomfort that comes from people that cause difficulties or hurt feelings or strained relationships. And yet Paul says that these divisions, these disagreements, these different viewpoints and different ways of seeing things and doing things and understanding things, he said these are a necessity in order to give us the chance to grow in our responses toward those divisions. Opportunities to mature. Opportunities to literally come to not resent those people, but come to appreciate those people as we learn to maybe see life through their eyes. Not that it changes our theological understanding, not that it changes even the way we interpret or apply that scripture, but just a willingness to accept the fact that they, as a part of the bride of Christ, loved by Jesus just as much as he loves us, offer to the body this varying viewpoint which gives us the chance to grow and to mature. And as Paul says here, the chance to recognize that we are truly genuine believers. He goes on, verse 20, to say, So when you come together um, for this agape feast, this love feast, he said, I, I need you to understand it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. I, I don't care what you call it. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you are going through the words, this is my body, this is my blood, this is done in your, you know, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. He, it's, like, it's like Paul says, I, I don't care what it is that you think you're doing. He said, I, I just want you to understand when you do what you're doing, it's not the Lord's Supper. More explanation, verse 21, he says, because in eating which is a reference to the, the love feast that took place before the celebration of the Lord's Supper. In eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. You don't wait on anybody. You don't make this the focus of fellowship. You make this the focus of, my food's getting cold, I'm going to eat it. I'm not waiting for anybody else. Now there's also, just understanding the context, there's, there's this very real part of the puzzle that, um, that we would better understand as a cultural, economic, um, you know, attitudinal uh, differences in, in the cultures that are represented. I mean, you have wealthy people that are bringing the finest food and the best wines and a lot of it. And they're opening their baskets and they're taking all of their food out and maybe they're getting the white tablecloth and they're getting the, the best dishes and the best silverware that they have. And, and they are just, boy, they're really making a spread. And, we don't know their heart, but really honestly, it's pretty obvious that part of all of this is they want everybody else to know how much they have. Well, you have, on the other end of the spectrum, you have slaves who, first of all, don't have the ability to even bring food because they can't take food from their master's house. They have no control over their schedule. And so if the master had said, oh, I need you to do this now, even though it's time to go to... Uh, the church potluck and Lord's Supper celebration, they have no choice but to just do what they've been commanded to do and then get to church as quickly as they can. So you have people most likely coming into the love feast late. You have people most likely coming in with no food, no white tablecloth and fancy dishes and fancy silverware. They just get there. Well, by the time they get there, the meal maybe is in full swing. And you have the wealthier people that are sitting over here and they're eating their food and they're laughing and they're enjoying this time of, uh, 
of celebration and feasting. And there on the other end of the table or in the corner of the room, you have a group of slaves that are just sitting there, maybe very hungry, waiting for this to get over so that they can be a part of the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And it's not just the food that Paul refers to. He says, you know, one goes ahead and eats his own meal. So one goes hungry, another gets drunk. And, you know, the comparison is that one has so much that it causes him to, to become drunk. The other one has absolutely nothing. Whereas in the appropriate attitude, everybody would be sharing the food. The wealthy would say to the slaves, hey, come sit by me. Yes, come sit by my white tablecloth and my fancy dishes and my fancy silverware. Come sit with me, share my food. Here, have some of my wine. Are you okay? Do you have enough? What can I get for you? You see, the, the attitude of this agape feast, Paul is saying, is every bit as important as the celebration of the Lord's Supper at the end of this feast. And so because there is such disparity, because there's such selfishness, because there is such um, hurtful, um, inconsiderate, unthoughtful treatment being kind of sent in one direction from another direction, the whole flavor, the whole atmosphere is absolutely the polar opposite of the heart of God. And, and so Paul continues, what? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? I mean, if you're going to treat each other this way, can't you do this at home? If you're going to just selfishly eat all your own food all by yourself, can't you do that at home? Or do you despise the church of God? And that's so critical. By your actions, by your selfishness, by the way you're looking down on others, the way you're, you're treating others, the way you're belittling others, the way you're, you're not thinking of others, he says you are literally despising the church of God. The church of God is the bride of Christ. You are despising the bride that Christ gave his life to save, for which this entire celebration is symbolic of. And, and I hope you just... You don't miss the irony. The very um, service that was designed to reflect on how much Jesus offered and sacrificed and paid in order to redeem his bride is the same service that is being used to make a mockery and uh, just a sham of the very bride that he died to save. And so that's why at the beginning of this, Paul says, it's, you're not getting together for the better, it's for the worse. It'd be better off you didn't even do it. Not only are you despising the church of God, Paul says, but you are humiliating those who have nothing. You are reinforcing those social lines. You're reinforcing just the reminder, you are nothing, I am everything. You have nothing, I have more than I need. You are a slave. Your personal property, I am uh, a self-made person. I am independently wealthy. I whatever. And you're humiliating those who have nothing, who have no choice in the fact that they have nothing. Whether they were born into nothing, whether they got there by some other means, it makes no difference. That's the one great thing about salvation and Christianity and, and Christ's offer of salvation is that it completely levels the playing field. We are all equals before Jesus as we come to him for salvation. Makes no difference what we own. Makes no difference who we marry. Makes no difference where we live. Makes no difference where we work. When we come to Christ, we are all the same. We are sinners, all saved by grace. And so Paul really, really hammers on um, the despising the church and humiliating those who have nothing. And then he continues with this verse. What shall I say? What do you want me to say to you? You want me to say it's okay? You want me to say it's good? You want me to commend you in this? No, I will not commend you. This is horrible. This is a travesty beyond words. You know, and, and just some of those other phrases that we use all the time come to my mind. I, I can just see Paul saying to them, what were you thinking? Where in the world is your head? How can you miss what you are doing? For I received from the Lord 
what I also delivered to you. I've given this to you before. I'm going to remind you of it again. This is what the Lord's Supper is all about. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Corinthians, do you not understand? How can you miss this? On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he demonstrated absolutely the most self-sacrificial attitude that was possible. He shared his life to save his bride. You can't even share your food with his bride. He poured out his blood until he was dead. You can't even pour a glass of wine for the slave who sits at the end of the table with nothing. He gave absolutely everything. You are willing to give nothing. Do you see? Do you see the comparison? Do you understand the whole point of the Lord's Supper is to remind us what Jesus offered, how much he gave, what he lost in the process? How can we become so callous to this? that we could be guilty of what the Corinthian believers were guilty of. As we celebrate, we are making a proclamation to the world, not just to ourselves, but to the unbelievers in our circle of friends who maybe are not in church and will never see this done, but for us to have the opportunity to tell them and share with them, this is what it means, this is what it represents. We can't, on the one hand, say, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus was willing to give his own life when we, on the other hand, are not willing to even share a meal with someone that maybe we don't like very much. You know, it's, it's, it just reminds me so much of even that passage in Matthew where the Lord is talking about offering a sacrifice on the altar. And we would understand that today in worship. So, in a sense, we could say, the Lord is making the statement, when you come before me in worship... And you remember, or the Lord brings to your mind, a brother or a sister who has done something to hurt you or something that was not right against you. The Lord says, before you worship, before you offer your sacrifice, he said, you need to go and you need to straighten that out with your brother or sister. And once that's all straightened out, once forgiveness has been offered, once forgiveness has been accepted, once you embrace and love on each other, once you restore that relationship with each other, then come back and worship me. You know, I'm going to be careful to not read too much into that, but you know, it sounds an awful lot to me like the Lord is saying, I don't want your worship if you're not right with each other. Maybe even I'm not going to accept your worship unless you're right with each other. That helps us to understand how critical it is. And I know for, for many of us, our entire Christian life, we have, we have celebrated the Lord's Supper. And in preparation for that celebration, we've come to a passage like 1 Corinthians 11. And we've skipped over these first verses, and we've just focused on just these last verses that, that we read together. As though the only thing that we really need to do to prepare to celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus for our sins is just to be sure we're okay with him. Lord, forgive my sin. I repent of my sin. I, I submit to you. I, I come before you to worship you, to honor you, to remember what you've done for me by taking part in this celebration of the Lord's Supper. And yet, the other part of this that I believe is absolutely just as important is the relationship that we have with each other. And so not only should we be preparing for the Lord's Supper vertically by confessing our sins to the Lord and asking forgiveness, we really need to be doing that horizontally as well. 
And it doesn't happen every time, but there are times as we are preparing to celebrate that the Lord brings a person to our mind. And we know that our relationship isn't good. We know that there's a strain there. We know that there's either been hurtful things that have been said or hurtful things that have been assumed. Maybe we've allowed a third or a fourth or a fifth party to share with us some gossip they heard about this certain person that confirms what we're sure of. And yet we are unwilling to obey Scripture and what Matthew chapter 18 and verse 15 talks about, whenever a brother or a sister sins against you, we are to go to them and we are to confront them. To give them the opportunity to say, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean that. That's not my intention. Um, or I'm sorry. And yes, that was exactly my intention. But as the Lord convicts me about it now, I was wrong and I asked your forgiveness. That is an important part of preparation to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And yet I've recognized in churches all through my years on this earth, that's not a passage that's followed very closely very often. It isn't easy, it's awkward oftentimes. And because maybe we don't trust the Lord to bless what we're trying to do, we either sweep it away or we just try to forget about it. Or we say to our, ourselves, well, I have forgiven him, so that's all that really matters, and I'll just move on. And yet that's not what matters alone. What matters is that we are willing to allow the Lord to use us to challenge a brother or sister who's maybe done something or said something that was wrong in order to help to continue to purify the church, to wash it, to cleanse it with the washing of the word to nourish it, to cherish it. And that's our part in that. And you know, sometimes when we go to confront someone else, we find out that really we were the ones that started the whole problem because of something that we said or something that we did that we have conveniently forgotten. about. This morning, I just want to encourage you, as you are spending time here, just a few minutes, preparing your heart to worship the Lord in the remembrance and the uh, practice of uh, the Lord's Supper, if the Lord brings someone to your mind, then let me encourage you to reach out to them. Now, maybe now it's a phone call, maybe it's an email or a text, but in that communication, all you simply say is, you know, friend, as I was preparing to celebrate the Lord's Supper, he brought your name to my mind, and I have to admit that there's a strain between us. If I'm responsible for beginning that, I just want to apologize to you. I just want to ask your forgiveness. If that burden falls on your shoulders because it was something that you said or did against me, maybe I don't understand it correctly, maybe I do. I'm just asking you, is the Lord convicting you that you would ask forgiveness of me? Because if so, I am ready and willing and anxious to offer or to accept the forgiveness that you offer. I, I don't want this relationship to continue to be what it's been. And instead of just ignoring Matthew 18, instead of trying to twist it to make it really easy to deal with, I'm just encouraging, encouraging you, just, just obey. Just, just try. See what the Lord does with it. Could be your spouse. Could be your children. Could be just a friend or a neighbor. Could be just somebody at church that you're not real fond of. And the Lord will not give you rest about that person's name. Because in order to really honor Jesus in remembering what he's done for us, we have to be just as right with each other as we are with God. My brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Right? And, and going back to that whole attitude, wait for each other, care about each other, love each other, be patient with each other, share with each other, give to each other. In the same way, Jesus might say, in the same way that I gave everything for you, give what you have to them. And then he says, if anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. If, if you can't wait that long, 
and get a snack, okay? Eat so that you're not starving when you get to this love feast. So that when you come together, it won't be for judgment. Because you'll be able to act like believers who do love and care about each other. And then he says, about the other things, I'll give direction when I come. You know, there's some other things I need to visit with you about, um, but I'm not going to take the time right now. Do you understand from just the context and, and the way this, this whole passage flows together, that the way we treat each other is critical. And how we look at each other is so very, very important. So much so that I believe our worship is unacceptable to the Lord if we are constantly ignoring the Holy Spirit's reminders to fix the relationships that need to be fixed. To ask forgiveness to the people that we need to ask forgiveness to. To start a very difficult, awkward, and hard conversation with someone that somebody needs to start that conversation. It needs to be you. And so this morning, it's just a reminder that celebrating the Lord's Supper is not going through the motions of the cracker and the grape juice, pray the prayer, eat, drink, okay, I'm good now. It's so much more than that. It is an act by which literally we humble ourselves both before God and before each other. Confessing our sins to God and each other. Asking forgiveness of God and each other. Because what we are preparing to celebrate is the very event by which Jesus died to secure the bride that we are celebrating with. And it is so very, very inconsistent and displeasing to the Lord when we would be thanking the Lord for doing what He did in order that we could be a part of the people that we don't like very much and that we really don't want to talk to and we certainly don't want to ask forgiveness of because they're not our favorite people. Friends, every single opportunity that the Lord brings along our way to recognize our failures, our sins, and to seek restitution with those people or offering forgiveness or just simply saying, I'm so very sorry, I was wrong, and I didn't mean it to get so out of hand. Every one of those opportunities, Paul tells us, is a necessity in order that we might have confidence that we are genuine believers who have been approved, who have literally passed the test. If this in any way applies to you this morning, would you just spend some time with the Lord? Would you promise Him that you will take care of it this week? Will you ask Him for wisdom on how and when and where and all of those questions that right now you might not have a clue about? Would you just tell Him that if He would give you the strength and the courage, you will make the effort to try to restore the relationship that you know right now is broken. And that you want to do that because you want your worship to be acceptable in His sight. And it's because you believe that His Word is true and that when He tells you in Matthew 18, 15, what you need to do, that you are going to believe Him, you're going to obey Him, and you're going to trust Him to accomplish His will through your obedience. Well, we come now to the time of remembrance. I am going to take a moment and thank the Lord for the elements that you are about to celebrate with in your home. Remembering that the cracker or the pie crust, whatever it is that you are in a moment going to be holding in your hand, it, it literally represents the broken body of Jesus Christ, his torn flesh. Bones were not broken, but boy, his body was lacerated. It was bruised. He was so badly beaten that he was not even recognizable as a man. And when you hold that element, that's what you're remembering. How much he suffered physically for you. And then as you take the grape juice, you recognize that it symbolizes the very blood that he shed in order to save you and to save me. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. 
without Jesus' death on the cross, and a death that also including the pouring out of his blood, there is no forgiveness. And so as he met with his disciples and he said, this, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. In the same way that he had said about his body, this, this uh, bread is my body which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. So when I am done thanking the Lord for his sacrifice, thanking the Lord for these elements, uh, then Bart will come on and there will be another song. And during that song, I just want to encourage you, just take a few moments, maybe pray alone by yourself, and then maybe pray together with your family or with those that you're with, if, if that uh, seems appropriate for you, and then partake of the elements in a heart of gratitude and appreciation, not only for what Jesus has done for you, but I think as well, gratitude and appreciation for the family, the church family, that he has made you a part of. And remember, and honor Jesus today in your heart, in your attitude, in the way you do this. And then we will finish with prayer. So join me now, would you, in this prayer of thanksgiving for what Jesus has done for us. Oh Lord, our, our hearts are just overwhelmed with how much you love us. That you would be willing to endure the horrible death that you endured for us. Your body just shredded, beaten, bloodied in every way imaginable. You endured every last punch for me. Every last beard pull for me. Every last lash of that horrible cat of nine tails that you endured. Lord, you endured that for me. And as you hung on that cross and you poured out your life, you did that for me. Oh, Lord, I thank you for that today. And Lord, I just want you to know that I love you and I love your bride. And I'm so honored to be a part of your bride. Thank you for this wafer. Thank you for this grape juice. Lord, I, I receive them with thanksgiving and gratitude. And even now as I partake, as I remember your death, through eating and drinking these elements, I do so with a heart of thanksgiving, with a heart of love, with a heart of appreciation. And Lord, I pray that our family would be able to do that as well today. Lord, I ask that as a church family that we would do a better job of loving each other, of forgiving each other, of going to each other. I ask, Lord, that we would be a family that is quick to forgive that is even quicker to no longer hold that offense against the person who committed it. That we might know your blessing and that we might know the joy of your salvation that comes through the forgiveness that you offer to us so that we can offer it to others. We commit this time into your hands. We ask, Lord, that you would make it a powerful time in each of our lives and that we would be different because of this time of remembering. And we'll thank you for it. And we'll ask all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. And even now as you enter into this time of remembrance, I pray the Lord would move in your heart. I pray that this would be a very meaningful time. I pray as well that God would bless you this week. And he would continue to draw you close to himself. That he would continue to cleanse and purify his bride until he comes to take us home.